Ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to today's, this month's non-farm payrolls webinar with me, Michael Hewson, covering the July payrolls report. Um, just, just some general housekeeping, uh, risk warnings and what have you. Um, obviously, I won't be giving direct trading advice, but certainly in the context of how I view the numbers, um, hopefully we will get some idea of the effect of what a good number will have, what a bad number will have, what is going to be perceived to be a bad number. You know, are we in a bit of a Goldilocks scenario when it comes to um, a deterioration in economic data, slowing inflation, um, a weak jobs number, what would that do? Certainly what we're seeing at the moment with respect to bond markets and stock markets, we are getting slightly different interpretations of the price moves in light of um, Chairman Powell's, shall we say, slightly ambiguous, if I'm being honest, um, press conference because his comments that the Fed neutral rate was in and around two and a half percent, which is essentially where the upper bound of the Fed funds rate is right now, was, was, was taken in such a way by markets as to suggest that the Fed was unlikely to be hiking as aggressively, perhaps, than was originally thought to be the case three or four weeks ago. And that's been really well illustrated in terms of the reaction of bond markets, particularly, say, for example, if we look at, if I can actually find the uh, chart that I'm looking for. Here we go. I finally managed to drag it in. I don't know what was going on with my my, my desktop there. Um, previously, I've been talking about a break of a the break of a head and shoulders reversal on the US 10-year yield. So this is your neckline here. Generally, what happens is when this sort of pattern breaks, we get a push to the downside, which would imply a move towards 2%. Now, we've, we've rebounded off two and a half. And Bullard and Mester's comments earlier this week pushed us back above 2.8. But what was quite interesting about that particular move, and that's the move on the oh, you know, that's the move on on Wednesday. That's the move on Wednesday. We pushed up, but we actually closed lower, which suggests that there wasn't much enthusiasm for that particular move. Um, so what's that telling us? Well, certainly the, the there is some disinflationary forces going on at the moment in terms of what markets are pricing. We looked at the prices paid data earlier this week from the ISM manufacturing numbers, from the ISM services numbers, and we saw sharp falls in those numbers in July. Um, the prices paid for manufacturing fell from 78 to 60, which was a huge fall. So there is certainly evidence on the actual underlying pricing numbers that inflation has peaked or plateaued in the short to medium term. And yet when you look at US CPI for June, we jumped to 9.1%. Um, and certainly that places much greater emphasis on the CPI numbers that are due out next week for, for, for July, because I think there is an expectation that perhaps those numbers that we saw in June were I think partially, well, mainly driven by food and energy, particularly US gasoline prices. And of course, since then, we've seen prices come down. And we've also seen the dollar weaken as well, but only in the context of the uptrend that it's been in since the beginning of the year. So we've seen a pullback in the dollar. We've seen a pullback in yields. And we've seen a pretty strong performance in US and European equity markets, which is a little bit of a Goldilocks scenario. But that really supposes that the, Fed, that the Federal Reserve is likely to pull back on hiking rates. And I am not convinced that they are. And even if they do stop hiking in 2023, it certainly doesn't mean they're going to start cutting. So, you know, that, that, is, that is the conundrum that markets are currently wrestling with. And certainly what the 10-year yield is telling us is probably not overly constructive relative to what the two-year yield 
is telling us. And certainly, I think, given the dire predictions from the Bank of England yesterday, which made me um, start to reach for the um, for the whiskey bottle, um, it really, you know, there is an awful lot of concern. I think that inflation, while it may be topping, it's not going to be coming down sharply. And I think that's through the that's the prism through which we have to look at what's going on in equity markets. And certainly I think Bullard's comments this week and Mester's comments this week are putting a much greater emphasis on what the unemployment numbers and the jobless numbers are telling us. Because I think the stronger the data is for the jobs market, then the more likely it is that the Fed will continue to hike rates into year end. And I think that's what we need to start thinking about. But unfortunately, I think bond markets are still looking much longer term. They're pricing for recession, which is probably the right thing to be pricing for, because if the Fed is going to continue to hike rates, that will impact on demand. And certainly, I think some of the numbers that we're seeing coming out of, of retailers would support that hypothesis. And certainly, I think in terms of looking at whether or not prices have plateaued, I think one one particular item can really shed some light onto that, and that is the agricultural index that we have for CM, the CMC agricultural index, which peaked all the way back in May. This is this includes wheat prices, corn prices, and oats prices, and these have fallen back to the levels they were prior to the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to, going to, they're going to continue to fall. Um, but it, what it certainly does tell us is that the inflationary pressure that we were seeing in April, May and June has started to diminish. More importantly than that, if we look at Brent crude prices, they've also fallen back quite sharply as well. So, on, on our continuation contract for Brent, we're below $100 a barrel. But what's even more interesting is if we look at the December contract for Brent, that's trading down at around about $91 a barrel. $91 a barrel. So it's quite a bit lower in terms of where markets are pricing crude further out down the line. So again, a, dis a disinflation or a disinflationary, I'm not going to say deflationary because we're certainly nowhere near that, but certainly markets are pricing a much weaker oil price two to three months out. And that's that prevailing trend is feeding into bond prices. Now, obviously, you've got natural gas prices, which is which are, which are going in completely the opposite direction. Um, they're near um, multi-month highs. For US, we can see that here, where there's a decent top at around about nine and a half percent. So that is what I think central bankers and central banks in general are really concerned about. And UK natural gas prices as well, which topped out in the middle of July, they've been edging up since the beginning of the month. And that's really the problem that central bankers are having to wrestle with right now. So Fed pivot, no. Big question is what sort of payrolls number is going to elicit a response in terms of either a stronger dollar, a weaker dollar, or a spike in yields? In terms of the yields question, particularly the US 10 year, um, we can we I think we can say with a certain degree of confidence that we are in a downtrend still with respect to that. So the lows are getting lower, the highs are getting lower. Yes, this is a bullish reversal here on the daily chart, which could take us all the way back to 287. But what it doesn't do is invalidate the head and shoulders reversal. So you've got to remember that currently where we are at the moment, we're around about 269, 270. So there is certainly potential for us to go at least another five or 10 basis points up without reversing the move lower that we've seen from three and a half percent back in June. And maybe next week's CPI numbers are probably the catalyst that could determine whether or not this trend down continues. And it's probably less about today's payrolls numbers in the context of that overall story. 
In terms of euro dollar, um, a weaker dollar could actually see euro dollar push back up to this level here, 102.75, 102.80. As you can see, there's a big top here at euro dollar in terms of where we could go next. And ultimately, given what we're seeing with the dollar index, given what we're seeing with euro dollar, I'm still of the opinion that we sell the rally in euro dollar, given the fact that natural gas prices in Europe are likely to have a much more significantly negative effect on the European economy than they are anywhere else. Um, I mean, the UK economy will be, effect, will be affected by it, and certainly the dire outlook that was painted by the Bank of England yesterday would appear to suggest that, you know, things are really, really bad. But however bad they are here in the UK, they're going to be degrees of magnitude worse in Europe, particularly in Germany and Northern Europe. Probably not so much in Southern Europe, where they get their natural gas um, from Northern Africa. Um, it's really the, the economies in Europe that are reliant much more on Russian natural gas. And for that, you're going to have to blame Germany because they still get around about half of their power um, down by Nord Stream 1. Um, so the question I was asked earlier was, would a strong number, would a strong payrolls number push equities down? I think it's probably going to act as a little bit of a top on equities. And certainly, I think the, the levels to watch for are as follows. We're going to start with the S&P, because if we can look at the S&P here, we can see that we've got a decent area of resistance around about 4,200. So let's just get rid of that and pop in a nice horizontal support and resist, resistance line through there. So around about 4,200, there or thereabouts is probably likely to give us a decent indication of where a decent support and a decent resistance level is likely to be. Even though we've broken that minor downtrend line there, we still got those highs there. More importantly, I think, than that is the fact that the NASDAQ 100 is pushing right up against a fairly decent resistance line from the highs here. So I think a fairly decent number, we're expecting 250,000. Um, bearing in mind, we expected 250,000 last month and got 372,000. Um, anything north of 250, 300 is likely to be potentially negative for equity markets. It's, 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 I struggle to make the case for a strong rebound, given the outlook that's currently been painted. Now, that's not to say that outlook is likely to pan out. And, it, and one of the things that the Bank of England said yesterday and was very honest about was the impact that higher natural gas prices were likely to have on growth going forward. But I think that scenario is unlikely to play out because it assumes no response whatsoever from governments, notably the UK government. And, and yes, you know, basically people are distracted by the Conservative Party leadership contest. But we should know by 5th of September who the new prime minister is going to be, if not necessarily before that. And ultimately, there will need to be an emergency budget because, you know, energy bills of £3,800 a year are going to push around about half the UK population into energy poverty. And it's hard to see how any, any economy can ride that particular um, fiscal shock out. So there will be something that they will have to come up with, certainly more tax rises is, are not the way to go. So around about this sort of area here, 13, which is basically akin to the highs that we've got at the moment, 13,000, I'm going to say 13,400 as a fairly decent resistance level. If we get a strong move here, then there's certainly potential to go back to the 200 day moving average, which as we can see from here, has acted as a fairly decent barrier going forward. The important thing to note here is we're still in the downtrend. You know, we have not necessarily seen um, the start of a new uptrend here. Certainly, there's nothing in the price action that's make, that makes me think in those terms. Before we get to the numbers, please feel free to ask any questions. Again, we've got the DAX here. We're still in the downtrend here. So um, 
again, this this particular doji here would would appear to suggest that the upside again is starting to get a little bit stretched on the upside. We are running into some key resistance levels on all the major indices. We can see that on the FTSE 100 as well, very long upper shadows. So again, here, any spike higher, that they're finding much more and more difficult to sustain in the short to medium term. And as we head into the weekend, um, I think it's unlikely, even though we've had a fairly positive week stock-wise, it's unlikely that we'll make new highs unless we get a really horrible number. And I think that's the only thing that would potentially push stocks quite a bit higher if we get a really rubbish number on the payrolls. Um, as I said, 372 on the previous number, which was and which was up till today, the worst number this year for US payrolls. We haven't had any ADP payrolls numbers for the last two months. We will start to get them next month because they're changing the methodology on that. But ultimately, I think anything in line with expectations, 250,000 would appear to suggest that um, the labor market is robust. There's still job openings just below 11 million. So there's no lack of tightness in the labor market. It's, it is still relatively tight in absolute terms. Wage growth, again, that's expected to weaken from 5.1 to 4.9, which is extraordinarily counterintuitive when you think about it, because if there's all these vacancies, why aren't wages higher? Why isn't the participation rate higher? It should be, and yet it's not. But there is some evidence that more people are coming back into the labor market as a consequence of the fact that prices are rising and ultimately they need to pay their bills. So I think when we look at the dollar reaction in terms of today's payrolls numbers, I think a strong number will be dollar positive and equities negative, and a weak number, conversely, will be equities positive um, and dollar negative. But again, it will be very, very short term. One number does not make a monetary policy decision make. And I still think that we will find that in September, the Fed will hike by 50 basis points at the very least. And let's not forget, we also have the, Jan the Jackson Hole um, annual symposium at the end of this month. So we could get further clues as to what the Fed is likely to do in September in any case. But to my way of thinking, we st I still think we'll probably get 50 basis points in September. Um, the Bank of England probably was, is, is going to have to go the same way unless we get any significant indication of weakness. But certainly I think even though we're starting to see inflation level off and start to roll over, any thought that we're going to drop from 9 or 10% down to 3 or 4% in the next 12 months, I think you really got to be very optimistic and perhaps maybe um, a bit on the grog because I can't see the Ukraine situation changing anytime soon. And that for me means that natural gas prices are likely to remain fairly elevated. So let's wait for the numbers and I will now be quiet and wait for the market reaction. Unemployment down to three and a half percent. Canada payrolls was down. 528. I mean, that's a huge number. 528 non-farm payrolls. I mean, that is an absolutely huge number. So that suggests to me that there's more people coming back into the workforce um, by virtue and wage growth strong as well. I mean, that's strong dollar and very negative for equity markets. So it does appear that um, that's played out exactly as I suspected it would. And essentially it means that uh, 50 basis points is, is the very least that we can see. I mean, it's double consensus, double consensus. So, I mean, we might as well throw our models completely out of the window. I mean, not only did non-farm payrolls beat consensus in June, 250 were expected, 372. We've even gone higher than that in the revision, as we can see there, 398 from 372. Um, but we've we've double consensus here and the unemployment rate has dropped to 
three and a half percent. Now let's have a look at the participation rate because I think the participation rate could be also be very instructive when it comes to the, the payrolls numbers because if the unemployment rate has fallen and the participation rate has gone up, that is very much a positive factor. So that we were expecting 62.2 on the participation rate and that's fallen. I mean, that's just incredible. So, so the participation rate has come in at 62.1, which, let me just pull my Bloomberg out of the way. So yeah, that's that's fallen back ever so slightly. So that's got me scratching my head. I've got absolutely no idea why the participation rate would fall back and the headline rate, headline non-farm payrolls rate will go up. But I mean, to be quite honest, it doesn't really matter. It's what basically the market thinks. And the market, strong dollar, euro dollar back down, cable back down, dollar yen slightly lower, sorry, slightly higher rather. What am I talking about? Slightly higher. So the, the next higher for dollar yen is going to be that 134.80 level that we broke below on the way back down to the cloud support back here and a retest of the 50 day moving average, which I talked about in my morning comment on the chart forum on the spread bet, the spread bet platform. So running into resistance at the 134.80 area and 50 day standard moving average and move above 138, 134.80, retargets um, 136, 136 area uh, and these these highs, these 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 lows back there. So as I might my approach to technical analysis is fairly simple. It's really trading the levels. And levels trading is probably the most efficient way for me. I'm not saying it's going to be the most efficient way for you, but the most efficient way for me in terms of how I look at the markets more broadly. Now, before I move on to looking at the Canadian dollar, does anyone have any questions as to um, any markets that they'd like me to cover? Certainly the, the, the Canada payrolls is going to be slightly dis overshadowed by the fact that the, the non-farms was so positive. But certainly I think in the context of this particular trend, the Canadian dollar has also been weakened by the fact that we've got lower oil prices. It's a petro currency. It is very much driven by how oil prices trade. So certainly in the context of this particular move, we're likely to see a retest of 129 and a half. I mean, we're pretty much already there um, and, a, and a potential retest back towards 130 on the basis of those payroll, payrolls numbers there. So um, does anyone have any questions on anything that I haven't covered already? Um, because that's what I'm here to do. Um, Let's look at, uh, let's do a quick preview perhaps of US CPI next week, perhaps. Actually, let's do gold because that's, that's always a nice, it's always a nice one when you get a strong dollar number like that. And the gold price has actually respected this downtrend line from the peaks back in March, as well as the 50 day moving average. We test, we pretty much hit it on the money. And uh, as I say, I mean, it's not something that I set up before. I'd almost forgotten that I'd drawn that particular chart. Um, but again, here, we've got a, another classic example of support and resistance lines being respected quite nicely. So not only was this trend line from, from the peaks here respected in the gold price, obviously, if we now look back at um, US, the U, the, our US yield chart, unsurprisingly, given what we were talking about earlier, yields are now higher to the tune of 279. So again, what I was saying earlier, we can see a retest of at the very minimum a move back to 285 on that number. And it's quite likely that we will probably get that. And obviously the dollar has rebounded off this level here. And actually, if we zoom in a little bit on this particular chart and make it a you can see that there's potential for a little bit of a bullish reversal on this daily candle back earlier this week. So certainly this bullish reversal here suggests that we're going to see a rebound in the dollar, perhaps back to around about 107.40, which obviously then means we get a lower euro dollar, given the fact that 
the dollar index makes up around about 57 percent of euro dollar um, you're all very quiet ladies and gents which essentially leads me to believe that perhaps you haven't um, got any questions or you can't hear oh here we go here we go now we're getting them now okay right so uh, da, 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 da. could not equity shrug stronger interest rates and push the s p to da, 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 da. super job report so hang on you're asking me whether or not because we've seen a stronger report it could actually be positive uh, have i understood you correctly alan i want to make sure that i'm answering the question right no and the answer to that is because the us federal reserve is likely to tighten faster and if the federal reserve tightens faster that will impact on demand it will pare back consumer spending and therefore sales and revenues of, co of us companies will diminish if the us central bank was inclined to tighten uh, loosen monetary policy then yeah absolutely that would that would certainly be the case but because the economy is improving it means that the fed is more likely to tighten than loosen so therefore it's not as good for equities so hopefully that makes sense usually over the last 10 or 15 years whenever you've had slightly improving economic data there's been never any prospect that the central banks would tighten monetary policy that dynamic has changed in the current environment better economic data is not necessarily good for risk assets given the fact that we've already rallied 20 percent from the july lows and that's the prism from with which you need to look at this particular um, piece of good news good news is no longer bad news um, so what, what, yeah, oh, sorry good news is no longer good news it's now potentially bad news so the big question is absolutely you've asked the right question where are the next key levels for s p for support well let's drill down into slightly shorter term so what we can see here is a four hour chart well initially the first support level is obviously the trend line support off the lows so we're looking at that level there but that's no good we don't want that because it's just too far away so let's now put in another trend line support off the lows from here and then we've got that now let's look at previous lows so this previous low here is likely to be the next key support for the s p 500 where is that it's 4075 uh, as well as obviously this trend line from here so the next area of support for the s p is going to be the trend line on this four hour chart from here as well as these lows through here so that's essentially the way i deconstruct a particular move we failed just below 4200 we've taken out these lows at 4135 now when us markets open in around about 40 minutes time you could well get an initial short squeeze perhaps but ultimately given how good those wages numbers are given how good those payrolls numbers are um, any thought of a fed pivot gone forget about it for at least the next four to five weeks simply on the basis of the fact that these numbers will potentially um, be will be remembered until such times as we get another payrolls report next payrolls report will obviously be the first week in september we've also got two more cpi reports between now and then the first one of which is next week so ultimately the narrative for now is better data equals more aggressive fed and that's the message that you need to take away so ultimately the next move lower on the s p is likely to run into support in and around these areas here obviously what also that means for the nasdaq is a slightly more different story it's going to be much more aggressive this move lower for the nasdaq and i talked about that because of this trend line here it's respected it perfectly um, which i was a little bit apprehensive about you're always a bit apprehensive about being short so close into a number or being looking to sell so close into a number so the next key support on the nasdaq is obviously this low here around about 31 13 160 which we're currently right at at the moment you've obviously got these twin peaks through here and i'm looking at an hourly chart here but if we do a similar sort of analysis on this 
we can also draw an interim trend line through these lows through here, but also look at these series of lows through here and those series of peaks there, which is around about 13,050. Um, there, there or there, about 13,070, 13,080. So again, it, it's not trying to be overly complex when you're doing analysis. You know, you can have as many MACDs, as many um, RSIs, slow stochastics as you like. The most important component when it comes to analyzing markets, it's price, price, price. Um, in terms of FIBs, yeah, Fibonacci, um, Fibonacci levels are just as relevant. So let's say, for example, you want to draw some Fib levels on this chart. That's fairly easy to do. You take the low there, you take the high there, but they only work if you're absolutely certain that we've seen the absolute high of this, of this move higher. At the moment, I would be reluctant to use FIBs quite yet until such times as we retrace at least 20% of this move higher. So FIB measures only work when you can be absolutely certain that you've seen a top or bottom of a particular move. This is just one set of price data. Um, a really good payrolls report or good really wages report. That could be all unwound the next week with the CPI numbers. So we're not there yet. We haven't taken out this low here on the NASDAQ. So I would be cautious about calling a top on the NASDAQ quite yet. Those numbers would suggest that we potentially have, but we still need to see confirmation of that particular move. So I hope that sort of makes sense to you. I'm hesitant to call a top on the NASDAQ quite yet. I'm encouraged by this data. Doesn't necessarily mean that we won't see it because in terms of the FTSE 100, we've seen a fairly decent bounce back. What happens if CPI is very low, then what? Well, then we go back to the entire, is the Fed gonna pivot, is the Fed not gonna pivot? The moment there's more emphasis on the equity, there's more emphasis on the labor market. And this is why it's very important that, you know, you move from data point to data point. And when you have a position and you've got a decent profit, you take that profit. You know, it's all very well having a stop loss. You also need to have a take profit. And you need to make sure that you take your profit, pocket the profit, and then move on to the next trade. You should never ever be wedded to particular, one particular stop loss when you're looking at a nice juicy profit. So, and I think that's one thing that really doesn't get looked at an awful lot. There's so much emphasis on stop losses and there's not enough emphasis on take profits. These numbers are good, but it doesn't mean the S&P is going to fall off a cliff. It doesn't mean the NASDAQ is going to fall off a cliff because as you say, you could get a very weak CPI number next week and then suddenly everyone's Goldilocks again. So this is the nature of what markets are like at the moment. And I think that's something that we, you know, we really do need to be aware of you know, trade the market as it is, trade the price action as it is, the data hopefully will support the move, but look at the price action first and foremost. Right, okay, I also got asked about Aussie dollar and I will cover that, I hadn't forgotten um, Mustafa, so I will do that now. Okay, so this is my long-term look at the Aussie dollar. As we can see, we've got this entire up move here. We've moved back down. We've traded back to 70.50, and now we're trading lower again. So the next key support on the Aussie dollar is the lows that we saw earlier this week at 68.80. Um, and obviously, what we also saw here was a bearish reversal on the move here. So obviously, further Aussie weakness goes slightly counter to um, what we've seen um, over the course of the last week or so. The RBA, in my opinion, will continue to hike rates. The RBA is still continuing to be behind the curve, but it will be outweighed by weaker commodity prices. So if commodity prices remain weak and the, few, and, and the Fed continues to remain hawkish, then it's quite likely that the Aussie will, will continue to trade towards the downside. I don't see the Aussie falling off a cliff, but I certainly see that the potential for weakness back to around about 68.70 in the short 
to medium term is this support here. If we break this key support here, then we could well head back towards the lows. But at the moment, we can see from the daily chart, if we drill down into the four hour chart, we can see that there's a decent area of support all the way through here. So you need to be a little bit careful about being aggressively short of it. But what I would do is if I was looking to trade the Aussie, I'd be selling weakness back to around about 69.80, 69.90 for a move lower. And it's really about where you look to get in when you're trading Aussie dollar. It's not about what you're going to do now. These payrolls numbers will push the Aussie towards these lows. The big question for me is whether or not we're able to take out these lows. Okay, so. Okay, any other questions, ladies and gents? Otherwise, I'm going to wrap this up and uh, wish you all a fairly. Okay, do you saw? Do I see more weakness in commodity prices? You're going to have to be slightly more um, specific because it depends which commodity prices you're talking about. If we're talking about copper. Um, let's have a look at the let's have a look at the copper chart. I still think we're going to see fairly decent demand for copper because ultimately the the, the energy transition will require um, an awful lot more copper. But if you look at the way things are at the moment, there's fairly decent resistance in copper around about 360. So I think the big question is is whether or not we've seen the lows, and and that and I think an awful lot of that will depend on demand out of China. We've got China trade numbers over the weekend. Um, if we look at this particular trend line here, we're very much in a reactive uptrend. If we take out 360, then we can potentially go higher. But again, it really depends about short term demand and the Chinese economy. Zero COVID, Chinese economy is unlikely to grow by anywhere close to five and a half percent this year, let alone three and a half. So it'll be very much dependent on demand over the back end of this year and I'm not confident about that if you're asking me longer term do I think that um, copper will go higher absolutely yes but we're talking over the course of the next two or three years in the short term it's much harder to call um, where will I where will Arsenal finish this season yeah thanks Phil um, higher than Spurs hopefully and um, that's all I'm going to say um, do I see silver recovering soon? Someone's got a sense of humour. That's funny. I like that. Um, ask me after the Palace game tonight. Um, silver. Again, we're probably going to see some short-term weakness in silver. I'm still laughing at that. Um, again, on the back of um, a on the back of a stronger dollar, we can probably come back to these sorts of levels here. So that's going to be around about the highs of July, $19, $19 an ounce. We can see it drift back to there. And again, we're in a downtrend for silver in the same way that we're in a downtrend for gold. So if we look at it through the prism of gold, if you're looking at potentially higher yields on gold prices, then until such times as we break higher in gold, because gold is a fairly decent proxy for silver, then I think silver prices are probably going to drift back down as well. Oil prices have already covered. Um, again, I think we'll probably continue to remain slightly soft simply on the basis of weaker demand in the back end of this year. I don't think the Chinese economy is going to pick up significantly strongly enough to drive oil prices back towards the levels that we saw in the early part of this year. So I can certainly see the scope for that. If you look at forward contracts for oil, then that would appear to suggest to me we are going to continue to see slightly weaker oil prices. But they're not the things that I'm worried about. It's natural gas prices that I'm more worried about. OK, um, anything else, ladies and gents? Uh, any sensible questions? Not like where will Arsenal finish this season? Um, because I'm not taking bets on that because I usually get that wrong. OK. Well, in that case, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your questions, both serious and tongue in cheek. And uh, 
I'll um, see you all at the same time, same place next month when we cover the August payrolls report and see whether or not we're any further advanced in terms of when is the Fed likely to pivot. Anyway, have a great weekend, ladies and gentlemen, and I'll speak to you all. I'll see you all same time, same place uh, next month.